We're going to be starting a new series called uh, Reflect. Um, have you ever asked yourself, have you ever had a question, what is the church? Amen. What is the church supposed to look like? I mean, is this what Jesus intended? What we're doing right now this Sunday morning. What is the church? What, what is it supposed to look like? What is it, what, how is it supposed to manifest in the earth? Amen. Don't get ahead of me now. Does it look like skinny jeans and smoke machines? Right? Or does it, or does it look like cathedrals, hymns, and rituals? Is it to manifest in groups of individuals keeping a moral checklist, which, when kept, makes them good people? Or does it look like people learning to be the best you that you can be through self-improvement and motivational pep talks? When Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, what did he intend? What was his vision? For his church, what did he intend for it to reflect? Jesus' vision is not just for the church gathered here on Sunday mornings, but his vision for the church is, a, is, the, is one of the church scattered throughout the week. That it won't be just tied to a single moment in our schedule. We as individuals should be reflecting Jesus' vision for our lives and our families and overflowing into our communities. To understand God's vision for humanity, we need to go back. We got, need to go way back to the original commission from heaven. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, God bless them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. This was the original charge given to humanity by God. Do you understand that? This is what God intended for his children to do in the earth. He intended us to be fruitful. Our Father's original desire for humanity was to live a life that was productive, one that had purpose, and one that had meaning, where we would experience the joy that comes from the fruitfulness of our labors. He desired for us to partner with Him in the earth through our labor to spread the fruitfulness of the Garden of Eden throughout the entire earth. You know that? Do you know the, the Garden of Eden had borders, it says? The whole world wasn't Eden. We had a job to do. He, he, he told us to multiply. God's desire, his vision, was a family. He commissioned humanity to have children, children who in turn would have children, who in turn would have children, who would live in unity with the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He desired a civilization that would live under the beauty and protection of their heavenly Father, their perfect Father, their good, good Father. Then he said to fill the earth. Our Father dreamed that his children would take what they seen and experienced in the garden and spread it throughout the whole world, bringing God's influence, his lordship, to the ends of the earth through lives that reflected heaven itself. And subdue it. See, what we fail to understand, what people fail to understand, is that by God saying subdue it, which literally means to conquer it, it means to conquer. He's implying that there's something 
that needs to be subdued. There's something that needs to be conquered. See, the Garden of Eden didn't have safety locks on it. It wasn't childproof. It was dangerous, as we've seen in chapter 3. There was someone that was trying to steal paradise, someone that was trying to, to paint a different vision for humanity, paint a different picture to, for the world to reflect something other than God. So Eden was this, was this paradise, but outside of the garden was darkness and chaos. Adam and Eve and their descendants were commissioned by God to expand the borders of the garden until it covered the entire planet. God's desire was for the earth to be completely under the influence of God and his perfect rule through his children. That's the commission of God. That's our original purpose and destiny. But as you know, paradise was lost. Paradise was lost. Humanity did not fulfill their commission from our Father, and in turn, we created a world in our own image rather than in God's. It baffles my mind to hear Christians say, well, why does God allow this? Why does God allow that? Or, or for people that try to cleverly say that there is no God, they say, well, if there is a God and if God is good, why do bad things happen in the world? Why is there genocide? Why is there rape? Why is there murder? Why, why is there backbiting and greed? And because of us. Because we created a world in our image rather than in God's image. So the question is, after humanity failed, after humanity rejected God, after humanity decided we will be our own God, we will choose what is good, we will choose what is evil, did God give up on his vision? Did he give up on his desire for the earth to be filled with his glory? For the earth to reflect heaven? Did he scrap plan A and then went to plan B or C? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We might give up, but God never gives up. One generation might fail, but there's another one coming. Scripture, from the fall forward, I like that. We didn't fall backwards, we fall forward. Because God, <laughs> from Scripture, from, from the fall forward, is the story of God redeeming his dream for humanity and the earth. And one of the best places to see the Father's heart is in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Pray then, the disciples, ask Jesus to teach us how we should pray. And Jesus says, Pray like this. Pray then in this way. Not pray this prayer, but pray. He's given them an outline. He's given them pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And, we, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When the disciples asked Jesus how they should pray, this was the template that Jesus gave them. Jesus gave them the task of picking back up the commission that Adam and Eve failed to carry out. This prayer brings us back all the way to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, to pick up where they failed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his followers to say something that they never dared to utter about God. And in so doing, we found our identity. Do you know that throughout the entire Old Testament, of all the prayers 
given up to God in the Old Testament, none of them dared to say these words, our Father. They never dared to utter the words, Father. They never dared to utter the words towards God, Abba, Daddy. See, through the fall and through sin, humanity lost their identity. They seen themselves separated from God and unworthy. See, it wasn't God who separated himself from humanity. Well, through our guilty conscience, we separated ourselves from a holy God. And we've seen ourselves separated. And we lost our identity of children, of children of God. That we were unworthy to be called a son. Does that sound like a parable you've heard? Father, I am, I'll go back and tell my father, I am unworthy to even be called your son. Just make me a hired hand. That's religion. It was considered blasphemous to call God Father. The Pharisees actually got enraged when Jesus called God his Father. But Jesus said to the disciples, this is how you pray. You pray, our Abba, our Daddy, our Father. See, because in Jesus, we see our true identity. Jesus came to reveal the Father. He came to reveal what the Father desired for humanity. Jesus is (laughs) the express image of God. We, we, We see that we are a part of a family the family of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus told us to say, our Father. This is Jesus bringing us back to our true identity and affirm who God is in our lives. There are so many people, even in this room right here, that you have have an easy way of nodding your head, yeah, God's my Father but deep down in your heart to actually believe that it's true is very difficult. And Jesus, Jesus wants to, you, he wants to reveal God as Father to you. This prayer also reveals God's identity. Father, of all the names, big kahuna, Big cheese, (laughs) your royal highness, boss man, lightning chucker, all the things that God could have called himself, all the, the great grand names that he could have revealed himself, that Jesus could have revealed God to the disciples then. Elohim, El Shaddai, Jehovah Rapha, pick your name. Of all the things that Jesus could have said, this is, this is the name of God. This is who he is. Jesus says, Father, Father, Father is the name that is holy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. Of all the names he could have picked, he picked Father. This is who I am. This is my holy name. This, I am the only true father. If you want to know what a father looks like, you look to me. Jesus says you're not to call anyone else father. But you have one father who is in heaven. God is our father. This is how God wants to be identified. This is how God wants to be revealed to his children. The name Father, that is the name that is holy. This is the name that God set aside for himself. This is the revelation that Jesus brought to earth. The name is to be celebrated, not to be feared. 
that intimacy. So many of us have a hard time entering into that intimacy of Father. This is a name that should bring rejoicing. This is a name that should produce worship. This is our Father, and He is a good, good Father. And purpose. In this prayer, Jesus showed us our purpose. When he prayed for us, or when he told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This gave us purpose. Just like in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was reinstalling our original purpose to be fruitful, multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. We were commissioned to co-labor with God throughout the earth to reveal the heart of the Father to the nations and reflect the kingdom of God. See, we take this prayer and and, and we put it off on a shelf that is for some day in the future. It's for some day in the future. It, it, maybe it's in the millennial reign. I don't know. But for your kingdom to come and God's will to be done on earth as in heaven, that can't be for today. Why, why is it the greatest promises that were given in the Bible, we so quickly are willing to put them aside for a different day? For somewhere in the future. And then we should be reflecting heaven. When he says, give us our day, this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Is there any lack in heaven? No. Is there any unforgiveness? Is there any grudges? Is there any, is there any secret sins? Is there anything that's keeping us back in heaven? He's saying, I want heaven to be reflected in your life. When these things manifest in our lives, it's the answer to us praying on earth as it is in heaven. These things are the reflection of heaven in the earth. See, this is not the Lord's Prayer. You know, the Bible doesn't say that this is the Lord's Prayer. That's a title that man gave it. This is not the Lord's Prayer. This is a disciple's prayer. How do we know that? Because it says, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. Jesus had no sins. This isn't Jesus' prayer. This is how he told us to pray. This is what he told us to believe for. This is what he told us that we, our life should, we should be expecting from God and it should be reflecting of God. It's our prayer. It's our prayer. This prayer is an um, apostolic prayer. That's just a fancy word for the way of an apostle. This is interesting. We, you know, we use words in the, in the church that a lot of people don't understand. We even give ourselves title, apostle so-and-so and all this. You know what apostle is? The term apostle was used by Greek and Roman armies. So this is a secular word. This isn't a religious word. This isn't something that they got from the temple. This isn't something they got from the Torah. This is a secular word. And it was used by the Greek and Roman armies to describe a leader of an entourage with an assignment to bring the culture of a conquering kingdom to a newly conquered region. Their purpose was to create a culture so that when the ruler came, he would feel as at home there as he did in his own kingdom. 
Would Jesus feel, our king, would he feel just as home here as he does in heaven? When I come, will I find faith in the earth? On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. All of the commissions in the the New Testament, there are many commissions that God gave his disciples and gave the church and gave, gave believers in the New Testament. All of them are just a manifestation of this main commission. This is the Great Commission. The Great Commission is that on earth as it is in heaven. The Great Commission is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In John chapter 20, verse 21, it says, So so Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you, just as the Father has sent me, I send you. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's saying, He's telling them what they should reflect. Just as Jesus was sent to reflect the Father, guess what? I'm sending you to do the same. The church is to look like Jesus. I'm to look like Jesus. You're to look like Jesus. In the same way that, in the same way, in the same purpose that Jesus was sent into the earth, to reveal the Father, to reveal the kingdom. That's our purpose, and that is our calling. Jesus was sent to reveal the Father and to manifest the kingdom of God, to liberate us from bondage so that we can go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and do the exact same thing. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus was going about in all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He's preaching the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. Jesus preached the kingdom and demonstrated the kingdom. There is no sickness. There is no disease in heaven, in his kingdom. In Matthew 12, verse 28, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you, come upon you. Jesus says when people are delivered from the spirit of this world, when people are delivered from the spirit of depression, when people are delivered from anxiety and fear, when people are delivered from demonic spirits, that means that the kingdom has shown up. That's the kingdom. If you're in bondage and if you're in captivity in any any area of your life, that is a place where the kingdom of God, where God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. Anywhere in our in our church where the kingdom of God, where the people are in bondage, where things aren't representing the kingdom, where, where there's, there's lack, there's suffering, there's God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. And the same goes forth for our communities and our nation and the world as a whole. Jesus says that people are set free when the kingdom has come. In Luke chapter 9, verse 11, it says, He welcomed them and began speaking to them about the kingdom of God. He's he's talking to them about the kingdom of God, right? So if he's talking, if I was talking to you about the kingdom, um, about how baseball was played, and then I started demonstrating the rules of football, would that make any sense? No, if I was talking to you about how baseball is played, then I would demonstrate the rules of baseball, right? So Jesus is talking to them about the kingdom of God, and then he demonstrates something, which is what? Making people sick, 
patting them on their head and say, it's okay, we, never, we don't know what God's will is. No, he says that in caring, caring those who had need of healing. Jesus preached the kingdom. Then he manifests the kingdom. Jesus reflected the kingdom of God. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I know right now that for some of you, you're thinking, this, I have a hard time believing this. I, I, everybody's supposed to get healed? In the kingdom it does. The only, the only reason it do, what doesn't is the kingdom isn't being manifest. God's not the variable. God, God's not the variable. And that's the hard thing to do. The hard thing to do is in the waiting, if there's waiting, or when it never manifests at all, to understand that we might not understand in this particular instance, but we know that God is good. We know what his will is. And we work back from that to our issue, our problem. But the first thing that we do is we question God. The first thing we do is we point the finger at God. The first thing that we do is say, God, why are you doing this to me? How can you be in faith and not trust God at the same, in, at the same time? You can't. Jesus preached the kingdom. He manifested the kingdom. He reflected heaven. He commissioned his disciples to do likewise. Look at this. In Matthew 10, verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven has come near. Some translation, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're supposed to be preaching the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The one who has believed and has been baptized will be saved, but the one who has not believed will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We are to preach the kingdom of God. We're to go into all the world and preach it to all creation. We, and, and, the, and those that believe, these are the reflection of their belief. They go forth preaching, and they don't fear demons. They don't fear man. They don't fear beast. They don't fear sickness and disease. They manifest the kingdom of God. They look like Jesus. Amen. In Luke chapter 10, verse 3, it says, Go, behold, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. And whatever, whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if, if the, a man of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. We're supposed to bring a blessing with us as we go. Hmm. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the labor. Is, the laborer is deserving of his wages. Do not move from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is served to you and heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. That's what it looks like when the kingdom of God is manifest. This is the commission from God. This is the commission for G from Jesus. Which is just a manifestation of our great commission. Going to, of Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Just as Jesus preached and displayed the kingdom, so too his disciples preached and displayed the kingdom. As we too, as we too are called to preach and display the kingdom. In so doing, we manifest our great commission of thy kingdom come, it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God still desires for earth to reflect heaven, for his kingdom culture to influence and shape our lives in the earth. So why? Why does the church not look like the church that Jesus envisioned? And when I say that, I'm pointing the finger back at ourselves. Why don't we? Why don't we here? You know, stop. we, we got to stop pointing at the churches all around the world. We need to point, look at ourselves. Why aren't we manifesting the kingdom? Why aren't we looking like the church that Jesus envisioned? Why aren't we looking like the lifestyle that Jesus demonstrated? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, I, th I really think this is it. It, it. it tells us that when we measure ourselves by ourselves and compare ourselves with others, that we are not wise. Did you, did you get that? When we measure ourselves by other people, well, they're a Christian, and I'm a, a little bit better than they are. Or we compare ourselves with other churches, other uh, denominations. Well, they sing hymns. They're not as spiritual as we are. They don't clap. This is what we've done. We have been, the church has been unwise. I heard this great example. I think it was Chris Valentine or... I don't know, I think it came out of Bethel, but it's a great, great example. There was this pastor. There was this pastor that they were building an a addition, a, a larger um, sanctuary under the church. And he was excited because of what they were going to be able to do and um, to have more people, uh, make it more comfortable, all these things. He was really excited about it. And as the builder started the building process, he kept on pestering the builder. He wanted to he wanted to help out. He wanted to put his hands to something. He wanted to be part of, of this construction and what, what God was doing there. But the problem is, is this pastor had no construction history in his life ever before. And he kept on pest, pastoring the builder over and over again. And finally the builder said, look, see that stack of two-by-fours right there? I need all the two-by-fours. I need all these two-by-fours to be cut to eight foot. And there was about 100 two-by-fours there. All those two-by-fours need to be cut to eight foot. And for the pastor, even though that's not that exciting of a job on a construction site, he was excited. He finally got to do something. He got to be part of it. So everybody left for the day, and he stayed, stayed there and started cutting two-by-fours. So he got the first two-by-four out, and he measured out eight foot, marked it, cut it. And then he brought another two-by-four over, and he took that first two-by-four and set it on top, and marked it, and put, and put the other two-by-four over here, and cut it. And then he brought another one over, took the two-by-four, put it on top, marked it, and cut it. And he, and he continued to do this, and do this, and do this, and do this. See, he was unwise. He was comparing one board to the next board. And with each, with each cut, it was a blade length longer than the original one. So... If he did this with one, two, or three, it would have been fine. No big deal. But when you got 100 two-by-fours that you're doing, by the time he was done, he had nine-foot two-by-fours. Not even close to the original benchmark. This is what the church does. The church. The church has compared themselves to those of today and those of the past. If we could just be like Azusa Street, if we could just be like the, the Church of Acts, if we, if we, could, just, if we could just get back to, to the Reformation. No, 
We got Lutherans comparing themselves with Catholics and Pentecostals comparing themselves with Lutherans and Baptists comparing themselves with everybody. We, we, we just compare, compare, compare. And we say, well, we're more spiritual than them because we do this. And they think they're more holy than us because they do this. And we compare ourselves with men of history. Oh, John G. Lake or, or Smith Wigglesworth or Billy Graham or whoever you want. You just you compare yourself with all these people. And none of them are the true benchmark. None of them are the true church, the true reflection of heaven. If the entire church just got back to the original benchmark, it would change everything drastically. It would set the bar to its original height. And a height so high that it would take faith in God to ever reach it. For 2,000 years, we have been comparing ourselves to previous generations. When Jesus Christ is our only benchmark. Jesus is our benchmark. See, there's a lot of mimicking, parroting, mockingbird. A lot of times I say that I'm just a mockingbird. I just, I, 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 I have never had an original thought. I just, I just consume and I just, and it all comes from, it all comes from uh, Holy Spirit anyways. But, the issue is, is when you start trying to be someone else. When you start saying, I need to act this way. I need to teach this way. I got, I got to have this type of personality to be used by God, to be effective for the kingdom. We, we do this. People try to mimic their fr- favorite preachers. And, and, and they're not comfortable in how God created them to be. But God gave us our personalities. You know that? Do you know that all of the disciples had different personalities? You think Judas had a different personality than Peter? How about John? Do you think he had a different personality than Peter? I think they all had different. Peter was totally on his own. But no. But they had different personalities. And And Jesus called them all. See, our gifts, our personalities, our history, our cultures, our sex, and our color, it all may be different, but we are called to the same great commission of manifesting the kingdom of God and teaching others to do likewise. The church of Jesus Christ is very, very diverse. Just look around here. But in our diversity, there is great unity. Unity in our calling. Unity in our commission. Unity in our purpose. Unity of the Spirit. Unity in our King. Unity in our same good, good Father. In Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came up to the up." And spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This has been called the Great Commission. This is not the Great Commission. This is a directive straight from our King to carry out the Great Commission, which is bringing God's will to earth and manifesting the kingdom and reflecting heaven. 
That's our original commission. You understand that? This is a way that we do that by preaching and, and teaching and demonstrating. It, it says here, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. We just read many of the things that Jesus taught the disciples. He taught them about the kingdom of God and, how to, and what the kingdom of God looked like and to do what he did, lay hands on the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. He even said, don't worry about taking any money with you. Because people, when you're out doing kingdom work, God will provide. And how does he provide? He provided through people. He says, eat, drink, whatever they set before you. A labor is worth his wages. We have the honor of creating a culture here in this church. And in our homes, and in the name of Jesus, our communities, and to the ends of the earth. One that reflects heaven. May we all have the courage and the boldness to choose this day to pursue, to pursue those words on earth as it is in heaven. And by faith, expect for measurable results of it being reflected in our lives. This is the opening to a series that we're going to look at. We're going to, we're going to go through and we're going to see that original benchmark and, and what God intended, what Jesus intended, what he envisioned when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to seek to create an atmosphere and a culture here in this body that represents the kingdom. We're going to, we're going to go for it. We're going to choose to go for it. We're not going to be apathetic. We're not going to just give up. We're going to see the things in the word, and we're going to say the promise of God, find their yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Is it scary? We say no. But it. It is, it, it's an adventure. The kingdom of God manifesting in the earth, in our lives, in our homes. We need to, we need to start believing this for ourselves. We need, to, we need to start having the kingdom of God manifesting in our homes. And it goes, it goes right back to the Lord's Prayer. And I'm not saying that you go and pray the Lord's Prayer over and over again, like a religious routine. But you do what we just did today. You break it down and say, this is how Jesus said that I should pray. Do I really believe that God's my father? Do I really believe that God loves me? After everything that I've done, the things that I've thought, some days, some days I have a hard, I even question if there is a God. Do I still believe that God loves me even though that I'm so unstable. <laughs> to get to that point where, man, God, if God loved you, if let me ask you something. If God loved you, what would be impossible? If God loved you, loved you, what would be what would be there to fear? The reason why we fear is because we don't we don't believe that God loves us. The, the reason why we don't have courage and boldness is because we don't believe that God loves us. Perfect love casts out fear. God is love. And when you're rooted and grounded in love, fear cannot dwell in that same 
atmosphere in that culture. In a culture of the love of God, fear cannot exist. Do you know that? And we, as a church, we as a small group of believers, we have an opportunity to take Jesus at his word and reflect the kingdom of God in our midst. And that's where we're going. I ask you to come along with me. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you. Hallelujah. That, that when you could have just wiped your hands and started all over, instead you did what your nature does, and that's redeem. You redeemed humanity. You brought us back to the, the, the paradise, our Eden. And you, and you are telling us in the same way that you told Adam and Eve that we have a mission to fulfill in this earth, and that's to reflect the kingdom of God, God's principles, God's, God's ways, his, his way of life, and that we are to conquer this earth. We are to subdue the forces of darkness. We are to, we are to, to resist and overcome the spirit of this age. That we are called to be light of the world. We are called to be salt. We, we, we bring revelation of who you are. And we illuminate the paths of so many people. And we are to preserve, to preserve humanity and the good news of the kingdom. Well, Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We love you. And as we seek, we seek to conform our ways to yours. We say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, so be it.